This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 111, recorded December 6th, 2010. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and it's time to talk about viruses. And once again, TWIV is on the road. And today, we are in Fort Myers, Florida, at the Florida Gulf Coast University, doing TWIV in front of an audience, which I believe is composed of some virology students, right? Anybody else besides virology students here? A couple of other stragglers who like to see what's going on. And we have a great crew to do TWIV today. Joining me here on my left is Rich Condit. Hey, Rich. Hello, Vincent. I, I could say hi, fellas, but um, there's more going on than that today. Yeah, Rich is in his home state. He's happy. To Rich's left is Andrea Leal. Is that right? Did I get yes, it? Yes, it is. Andrea is a deputy director of the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District and an entomologist. Mm -hmm. Get all that right? Yes, you did. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. Andrea, great to, great to come here. I should mention that Andrea and her colleagues have flown in from the Florida Keys on the backs of mosquitoes. No, no. <laughs> I, they were flown in, I believe, by our next guest, Amy Sargent, who's down there, the chief pilot. Is that right? Yes. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. How did you fly here? In a helicopter? In the Islander. An Islander. What mm -hmm. is that? Um, it's a twin turbine aircraft. Ah. We have two uh, turbine aircraft along with the helicopters. Did you have a good flight? Yes, we did. Very nice. Good day for <laughs> flying. And you guys flew in just to do TWIV, I understand, right? There's no other business for you to do here? No, nope, that's correct. So that's a first for TWIV. Pretty good. I grew up watching Sky King. Do they say, uh, warm up the songbird, Amy? No? <laughs> no. Uh, you're, too, you're too young. To okay. Rich, you always date yourself. Right. Finally, our last guest from the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District is Ed, Ed Fussell, the director. Welcome to TWIB, Ed. Thank you. Now, what's a shorthand for the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District? Is it something you guys use as a shorthand? Uh, no. Would you repeat that, please? Do you have a shorthand for the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got no vowels. You need vowels. Yeah. Otherwise, we can't make a. Uh, what do you call when you reduce I, a? I, Alan knows. Come on, Alan. You're the. Oh, we haven't introduced. Well, him. we haven't introduced Alan. He's sitting up there, not knowing what to do. Our Sorry. final guest is skyping in today, and we have him on the wonderful screen. Alan Dove, a science writer from Western Massachusetts. Welcome, Alan. Always a pleasure. Alan, this is the first time we're actually seeing Alan. After 110 episodes of TWIV, we have never seen Alan's face during the show. And this is right. Now, you saw my face way too much back when I was in your lab, Vince. That's right. That's right. And that's why uh, this will probably be the last time that we do this as well. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, welcome. I hope everything is clear for you, Alan. Uh, we're yes. here today to do a TWIV, and we thought we'd do a TWIV on dengue in Florida. As most of you probably know, not too long ago there was a, an outbreak of dengue in Florida. And we actually have reported on dengue a number of times on TWIV, but we thought we had the opportunity now to talk to the individuals that were involved in looking in mosquitoes and trying to control the mosquito populations right here in Florida where it happened. So this is a great opportunity. So I should mention to the audience, at any time, if you would like to ask a question, uh, Professor Isern over here has a microphone. And if you raise your hand, she'll come over and give it to you. So TWIV is all about participation. As you know, we get lots of questions from the audience. So uh, please We, we do should that. also mention that Professor Isern, Sharon, uh, is really responsible for getting this whole thing together. That's right. right? We met her at the uh, AS, the TWIV that we did at ASV, started chatting outside the meeting, and uh, one thing led to another, and here we are. This yeah, so, so Professor Isern invited us to do this TWIV, and we thank you very much. And without you, of course, it wouldn't have happened. Thanks. So thanks so much. 
Yeah. I wanted to thank you guys for coming down. Um, unfortunately, you did bring the cold weather with you. So, um, but, but welcome to Florida Gulf Coast University. We're, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. Well, I brought the cold weather because where I'm from, it's really cold. This is not really cold down here, even where you are rich. No, it's going to go not below freezing bad. again tonight, but still it's not cold. So, ah, but, none of you know cold. What, how, what's, the, <laughs> what's the weather out there in Massachusetts, Alan? It's cold. It's cold. Okay. <laughs> It'll be cold till May. Well, it's your choice to live there, but uh, that's yes. another story. Now, before we talk about dengue, I wanted to mention this building. This is a brand new building. It's called Academic Building 7. It's a LEED certified platinum building. LEED means Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. That's a building certification system. And this is the highest certification you can get in a building, and it's the first in the state of Florida. And may be one of the first anywhere. And getting LEED certified is based on a number of criteria, uh, including conservation of wildlife, habitat, and water, uh, energy efficiency, conscientious material sourcing and disposal, uh, air quality, and comfort. And I can tell you that these are very comfortable chairs. And if I were at a lecture in this room, it would be quite easy to fall asleep. <laughs> Don't you dare. <laughs> it's my, that is my criteria for comfort. And I can tell you I've spent 30 years at Columbia in lecture halls and I've never fallen asleep once because the chairs are too uncomfortable. So outside this building is a solar panel field, which we saw while we're coming in, that powers this building. So it's an amazing building and it's really cool to have uh, TWIV here. So not only thank you for having us, but also for having TWIV in this room. So before we talk about dengue, I'm really fascinated um, these are the first uh, mosquito control guys I've ever met. And I'd really like to know, um, what, is, what is the Florida Keys um, Mosquito Control District? What are we doing? Uh, what, 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 what is it in general? Describe it. Uh, mosquito control in the Florida Keys is uh, one of the most important uh, things that uh, we have that supports tourism. Tourism is our main source of uh, revenue in the Keys. And uh, without uh, mosquito control, air conditioning, airplanes, and maybe a couple other things, there would be no Florida Keys uh, that would be inhabited. Uh, there's a direct correlation between the development of the Keys and mosquito control. Yeah, we watched your video on the from your website the other night, and they pointed out that Florida was regarded as essentially uninhabitable because of uh, the temperature and the mosquitoes in particular. That's right. And the, the Keys is nothing but a great big breeding habitat for mosquitoes. And uh, we're also uh, <clears throat> completely within a National Marine Sanctuary, which makes our uh, situation unique because I'm not aware of any other mosquito control program that has, <clears throat> has to operate within such a, an environment. And uh, a lot of our uh, area where that produced mosquitoes was in a, uh, a wildlife uh, refuge that's classified as wilderness area. And if you're operating, anybody that's operated around a wilderness area, you, you know that you don't do anything in that area that is going to uh, modify or change. You cannot operate uh, uh, mechanical equipment or motorized equipment. So in, that increases in the challenge for the mosquito control? It, it def definitely yeah. does. But, uh, and it's our uh, responsibility to provide a means by which people that shouldn't be there, that they are there and they can live comfortably and, and make a living. So who finances the whole thing? We're a, an independent taxing district within the Florida Keys. We don't come under the county, which is Monroe County. We have our own uh, district. We have our own elected board of commissioners, and uh, we operate. So we're, you raise taxes locally to fund the whole we, operation? We, we, we tax all the residents of uh, Monroe County, which is the, the uh, essentially all of Monroe County that is inhabited is in the Florida Keys. Most of Monroe County is in the Everglades, and that's so. Uh, that's really interesting because when I first became aware of 
the mosquito control district, in particular in association with the dengue outbreak, I sort of assumed that it was a public health thing and would be funded in some broader fashion by some government uh, agency. It never occurred to me that it was a, a tourism issue. That's very interesting. Is there a control uh, commission such as yours in every county or every region of Florida? Uh, no. <clears throat> there, uh, there are only uh, 15 uh, mosquito control programs that operate as independent taxing districts. There are about uh, 50, uh, around probably 55 or something like that, that operate <clears throat> that what we uh, refer to as organized mosquito control programs. They operate under the state uh, guidance and uh, they uh, report their uh, operations, the use of pesticides and uh, that sort of thing to the state. And uh, uh, the rest, uh, these are mostly in the uh, coastal areas of the state. There are a few uh, inland, but uh, well, uh, uh, probably one of the larger ones this inland would be Orange County, Orlando. But uh, most of the mosquito control or have organized programs are uh, along the coastal mm -hmm. areas. It's probably worth pointing out that many states have similar control programs as well, right? I know my home state of New Jersey has a mosquito control commission as well, and I'm sure many other states do. Uh, there are other states. The, 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 there are three states that have the, uh, the highest level of organized uh, mosquito control. Mm -hmm. Florida, New Jersey, and California. Now there are others that have uh, a mosquito control and on a, an individual basis, uh, they are organized within their own uh, right. unit. But uh, uh, Florida, California, and New Jersey. New Jersey is, uh, uh, I guess, the oldest uh, uh, program that was organized, uh, but Florida was uh, close behind. There are many good things about New Jersey that people don't realize. <laughs> but that, that's the topic of another show entirely. So do you, is it safe to say that your activities fall into con two areas, control and monitoring? There, we probably uh, have the highest uh, degree of monitoring mm -hmm. of any program of which I'm aware. Uh, we, uh, we base our control program as much as we can, and I would say probably three quarters of it, on uh, larviciding. And the only way that you're going to be successful in larviciding is have a high degree of monitoring. And uh, about uh, just about exactly half of our employees are inspectors, field inspectors, domestic inspectors, uh, and uh, uh, that. Uh, that's that's where we put our emphasis. How many employees are there? We right now have about uh, eighty-five. And how many, roughly, how many square miles does that take care of? Well, in Monroe County, there are about uh, eighteen hundred square miles, and we have access to about uh, almost a hundred square miles. We don't have any access to the Everglades, or and we don't want it because we would uh, it, you know, use up all of our resources and still not be able to accomplish very much uh, there. So can you tell us in a little more detail how this works? Maybe uh, Andrea and Amy can also weigh in. I'm interested how you could, how you do the control. Let's work with that first. Do you do you does it involve spraying aerial spraying or does it involve manual uh, placement of of larvicides? Uh, well, or habitat first... destruction. What's that? Habitat or, or habitat removal? Um, we really don't do any of that, as um, Director Fussell said. You know, we um, we're very environmentally conscious down there. Um, when it comes to control, we have inspectors that go out um, basically to designated areas every single day and go out and see how many mosquitoes are actually biting them. It's called a landing rate count. So they'll stand in the field for about a minute and just count how many mosquitoes land on them. Um, also, we do a lot of different trapping, so we know mosquito numbers that way. Uh, the inspectors also so go wait out. A minute. Could you go do that, do that again? People <laughs> go out and stand there. People go and out and get stand, bitten? yes, in the field on a daily basis, um, and count how many mosquitoes 
land on them to bite them. Yes. Uh, how much do they get paid? <laughs> not enough. <laughs> you can ask them yourself. They'll say not enough. It depends on the time of year, I guess. This time of year, it's not too bad. Um, in the summer, we've had um, landing rate counts of 50 to 100 mosquitoes on one person in a minute. So it can get pretty bad in the summer. Wow. How do you uh, make sure they don't become ill? from this activity? Well, the mosquitoes that are biting them in the field are usually the salt marsh mosquito, mm -hmm. and um, we don't have any sort of um, history of them transmitting diseases down there. Okay, so uh, the the goal of this program, the main, a main goal is to make the region inhabitable, to make it pleasant, because otherwise people would be bitten and they couldn't do anything. Right. And, you know, it is, a lot of people are allergic to mosquito bites as well. So it is a health issue when you get um, a large number of nuisance mosquitoes. So it's not just the disease transmission, mm -hmm. um, which is also a possibility because we have historically had diseases in the Keys. Um, but also that, that health issue if you're getting numerous bites. Which, aside from dengue, what other vector-borne diseases are you worried about? In mosquitoes. Historically, we've had yellow fever. Right. We've had malaria. Um, we did have a couple cases of West Nile virus down there as well. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the main, the main mosquito-borne diseases. Not chikungunya. Well, of course, that's always in the back of everybody's minds. <laughs> but um, we're kind of hoping that that stays overseas for quite a while. And so, Ed directs a whole operation. Specifically, what's your job? Um, I do whatever Ed tells me to do. <laughs> <laughs> and that involves probably a little bit of everything, right? Um, we do uh, resistance monitoring. We do trapping, identification of all the mosquitoes that we collect. That way we know what, what mosquitoes are biting and where they are. Um, yeah, just a little bit of everything. By the so way, now this you, get this, you get this monitoring information. What do you then do with it to reduce the mosquito population? Well, depending upon what we find, um, if we get high numbers of mosquitoes in certain areas, we will um, aerially treat with insecticide. That's kind of a last resort for us. Um, we do have fog trucks as well, which are um, insecticides. But the main thing we do is larviciding, so we treat any mosquito larvae that we find in the water. Um, and that is really and is there Go ahead. Is, is there like a public education component of this too, or is that in a different department? No, we do public education as well. Um, we go out and teach in the schools. Um, we have a biologist that uh, goes to all of the festivals locally and has a booth set up with information. Um, we do newspaper ads. We have a television show that we produce weekly that has mosquito information. Um, yeah, that's a big component. Um, what we really would like to do is to get homeowners uh, really involved in, in mosquito control because, you know, even with the, the number of employees that we have, we can't be everywhere at once. So we'd really like to get homeowners involved a little bit more. Um, yeah, it, it's a goal of ours. And there's a, there's a website that describes your program that uh, Vincent and I were looking at last night. We'll put a link to it in the show notes, but that has a, a nice little 10 minute video that we show, uh, saw that was really nicely produced that really describes uh, the whole uh, program and has a significant public education component. Mm -hmm. That was really, uh, really good. Amy, do you uh, do the aerial spraying? Are you involved in that? Yes, I do both the adulticiding with the uh the insecticide, and then I'll do the larviciding in the helicopters also. So the that. larviciding is using a bacillus species, right? Which bacillus thuringiensis, BTI, I we believe. We use BTI, yeah. yes. And so that's dropped as pellets into the waters? Yeah, we actually now, um, as of just this last week, we have two types of larviside. We have a, a, a dry larviside, um, the Vectovac G that we put out, and we have hoppers on the helicopters, and we fly over all the the swamps and marshes and, and put out the dry pellet. Um, we're usually about 50 to 75 feet when we're releasing these pellets. And then Saturday, we just flew our first mission with our liquid larviciding um, system. And that was to uh, for the dengue down in Key West. We sprayed Key West and did a liquid larviside treatment. So when you do this aerial spraying, is it usually just the pilot, or did you have other people on board to um, It depends. When we're doing the adulticiding, um, we just have the pilots, also the liquid larviciding, we just have uh, one pilot. Uh, in the airplanes, uh, we'll have two pilots if we're doing the deltaciding. When we're um, larviciding with the pellet, we have an inspector on board because that's a lot of spot treatments. So we need the inspector on board to show us, you know, 
yes, we need to treat this area today, but this one, hmm. you know, doesn't have any larvae. So you, you must get really low in order to do this, right? Or, yes. Is that well, cool? <laughs> yes, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun. So what is the, uh, what do you have for airplanes and helicopters? We have two turbine islanders that we use for the adult deciding, and those have, um, Micronair systems. They're two pods. They look like bombs underneath the wings because it's a high wing aircraft. Two of these? We have two of the Islanders, okay. yes. And then we also use it um, to go to meetings around the state. I get to fly them around, so that's kind <laughs> like, of fun. Like TWIV. <laughs> and um, then we also have four helicopters. We have two Bell uh, Jet Rangers, B, uh, Bell 206 Bs, and then we have two Long Rangers. And I have to do this. Where did you learn to fly? <laughs> <laughs> I started in high school. Actually, they had an aviation program. So I was flying for the airlines after 9-11. I was furloughed and, and uh, found a job at Mosquito Control in and, Florida uh, Keys. Did, have you always flown helicopters? No, I was a fixed wing only. But then when the chief pilot position came open about seven years ago, they said I had to be dual rated. So they, at Mosquito Control actually trained me. Wow. So Ed and Andrea, I'm curious as to how you ended up doing this. I know you were an entomologist by training, correct? Yes. So you went to school. So how, when you went to school, did you eventually envision a, a career in mosquito control, or was did you have other things in mind? No, <laughs> not even close. Um, I went to the University of Tampa is where I got my undergraduate degree, and uh, my goal was to work with coral reefs. Um, but I was planning on moving down to the Florida Keys and just basically applied anywhere I could that had any sort of biology to go with it. Um, and luckily Mosquito Control had an opening and uh, I went to Mosquito Control and I really never looked back. And through Mosquito Control is where I got my entomology training. I got my master's degree mm -hmm. through the University of Nebraska. So um, yeah, it, it really grew on me and I really love the field. So I know your boss is here, but do you love this job? I do. <laughs> Somebody plug his ears, but no, I, I do. I do really love my job. Great. And Ed, I know you have a military background, right? How did you end up in, in um, mosquito control? I, I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia in uh, entomology. And I have a, um, a, a, a master's degree in epidemiology from Yale University. And I uh, retired from the Navy as a medical entomologist and uh, traveled uh, throughout the Pacific uh, primarily with a year in Vietnam. And uh, did uh, most of us uh, dealing with mosquito control. Uh. Hmm. One of our listeners some time ago um, wants to start a podcast on medical entomology. So something just like TWIV except dealing with your field. The relationship between various vectors and uh, infectious diseases, and I think it, that would be a terrific podcast. I'd yeah. subscribe to that. Yeah, I would too. Absolutely. And of course, you guys all knew that ultimately you would be on a virology podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that was always my goal. <clears throat> to to as part of your screening, do you actually look for viruses in in your specimens, or do you send them elsewhere to be? to be checked. Actually, that's where Florida Gulf Coast University comes into play. Um, they have been um, testing all of our collected Aedes aegypti mosquitoes for dengue virus for us since this past uh, June, I believe. So you don't do it in your laboratories at all? We do not. Um, however, we are in the process of building a laboratory to do our own mm -hmm. testing. Hmm. So okay. hopefully by next mosquito season, we'll be up and running. Sounds pretty good. Any questions? about careers before we move on. We'll start talking about dengue now. Be really curious to hear. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention this. For everyone who asks a question, I have a prize. <laughs> it was so oh, I have a question. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I can't hand this to you, Alan. But Alan, it is uh, one of our um, bumper stickers here. Actually, these, these are magnets. They say microbes, we need them. So I have, I don't know, I have 15 of them. They'll <laughs> stick on your refrigerator. So if you ask a question, I'll give this to you anytime between now and the end of the show. I'd like you to ask questions, but I really want to get rid of these two. They're really heavy. <laughs> I don't want to carry them with us. So um, as you know, beginning in the end of 2009, there was an outbreak of dengue in the Keys. 
And we've, we've talked about dengue a lot. Dengue, uh, TWIV number three was an entire episode on dengue. In fact, Rich and I listened to it in the car on the way down here. Uh, and then uh, Talk about nerdy, right? A couple of virologists on a road trip listening to themselves <laughs> on, the, on the podcast in the car on the way down. Well, we were learning, Rich. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but there's no question about the nerd geek element here for sure. Um, and then 95, I believe, not too long ago, we talked about the outbreak here in the Keys. As you know, it began when an individual who had vacationed in the Keys went back to New York State, and she was diagnosed there with dengue fever, which was a really very perceptive diagnosis on the part of the clinicians because she hadn't gone out of the country, so there were, at the time there was no presumption of dengue, which, as you know, is a, a tropical, mainly a tropical disease, although expanding in numbers. It's the most common uh, vector-borne viral disease that we know of at the time. Millions of infections globally, uh, and many cases of hemorrhagic fever, death, uh, as well as the less severe uh, dengue syndrome. Eventually, that led to screening here in the Keys, and if you read the CDC report, uh, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report had a wonderful article, May 21st, 2010, where they went through these cases, and, and we described them on, on TWIV 95, so I won't go into them again. Uh, but uh, they summarized the cases, and then there's a paragraph called Control Measures and Investigation in response to the three cases of locally acquired dengue. Those were three in the Keys. The Florida Keys Mosquito Control District increased the frequency of truck and spraying, et cetera. So that's what I'd like to talk about now. FKMCD, that's what you guys are, the FKMCD. You need vowels. You need some vowels, I know. <laughs> so what, here's, here's my first question. Uh, you found out about the uh, dengue cases in New York and locally. What, what did you guys do? And how, who, who told you first about this? The Department of Health, I presume? I believe that's where we got the information from, the Department of Health. Well, um, we have known for some time that we were uh, uh, very vulnerable to uh, getting a dengue or, uh, somebody mentioned a minute ago, chikungunya. I think it's on its way. And I know that they had a case in, uh, in Miami uh, recently uh, that happened to be a, uh, a case that included a, a dengue. It was a combination of dengue and chikungunya in one person. Uh, but uh, it'll, uh, it hasn't gotten uh, to the keys yet, but uh, I'm confident it will. But we knew that we had to uh, uh, get busy and uh, try to, uh, at that point, we wanted to, tr uh, to try to uh, uh, kill as many of the adult mosquitoes as possible to eliminate the transmission. And we uh, discovered that killing Aedes aegypti is not an easy job in either the larval stage or the adult stage, and particularly in the adult stage, because their habits are different than the uh, habits of the other mosquitoes that we normally uh, uh, control. The Aedes aegypti is active uh, during the day, and uh, the others are more active in, in the evenings or at night. So what percentage of the mosquitoes in the mosquito population are Egypti? Uh, what percent? Yeah. It depends on where you are. Uh, if you're in Key West, it would uh, be about uh, probably uh, little over half Okay. with the uh, uh, quinca fasciatus being So it's a uh, the significant other. fraction. Yeah. All right. And we, we do get some flights of salt marsh mosquitoes, the Aedes tenorhynchus, into uh, Key West, but that's not our main problem down okay. there. And now, it, Aedes aegypti is also a container breeder, so it's not like you can just treat large areas of water and be done with it, right? That's exactly right, and that's one of the things that makes it difficult. Uh, Aedes aegypti it will breed in any kind of a container that will hold water, and <clears throat> these mosquitoes do not lay their eggs in water. They will lay their eggs in containers on the sides of the containers that when they uh, fill with water, it'll flood the eggs and then they will hatch uh, almost immediately. So rain gutters would be about ideal. Uh, uh, rain gutters are, are, are very good places. <clears throat> and uh, the rain gutters are almost inaccessible in uh, most areas. So they're, that's an area that uh, they can breed in without being uh, uh, threatened. And uh, they can also breed inside the home. 
and uh, never have to go outside because they can uh, hatch, emerge as adults, find their blood meal inside the home, uh, have a place to lay their eggs, and they just keep doing uh, cycles without ever going out. It only takes a very small amount of water. And uh, we, uh, we tried uh, to, uh, the, the typical method of uh, controlling Aedes aegypti in the past has been eliminating the containers. If you can eliminate the containers, you should be able to eliminate the, uh, uh, all of the habitat for Aedes aegypti breed. Uh, we found that that was more of a job than, uh, than we anticipated. And uh, <clears throat> We would uh, uh, we wanted to reduce the uh, uh, what we call the incidence uh, rate to uh, like two percent, and that would mean that uh, if you inspected a uh, hundred uh, homes, uh, you would only have a breeding in two percent of them. If you can keep it that low, then your likelihood of having a transmission of dengue is not very high. But uh, <clears throat> we would. Uh, we had uh, as many as 35 or 40 uh, inspectors out going door to door, emptying containers, talking to the uh, residents, and uh, trying to get their uh, cooperation. And uh, <clears throat> we'd show them what to do and tell them uh, how, to, how to do it. And uh, in hopes that when we left, that they would continue to do it. <clears throat> we'd go back in about a week and find the same thing. Right. There over again, and that that continued time after time. We never were able to uh, convince the public to get informed or get in, involved, and uh, a lot of it in our case was due to the uh, uh, media. Uh, for some reason, the uh, the local uh, papers did not uh, get involved. Uh, the involvement uh, by the papers, uh, uh, they lambasted mosquito control for trying to take advantage of that situation to boost our budget. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, even a couple of uh, our own commissioners in mosquito control and several of the uh, elected officials around uh, the uh, city of Key West and uh, Monroe County, uh, they uh, uh, had some of the same sort of comments. Not one of uh, any of the uh, uh, commissioners, we had three commissioners on our board that uh, they were busy in trying to convince the people that this was a serious situation. All the rest of them, not one of them, uh, had anything uh, to say in support of mosquito control and try to convince the public that it was a serious uh, situation and that they should, for their own health and well-being, participate. So is this a, uh, obviously this was August 11th, 2009 was the first case and we see, I don't know when, when exactly you got involved, September, you were doing surveys through September through December 2009, so it's uh, uh, a year back. Um, what's the what's the situation now? Um, are you uh, uh, is is well we the had major epidemic or what the out, outbreak is is gone. There is this one new case in Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, are you uh, still uh, significantly concerned about dengue? And is the uh, relationship with the media improved at all? The answer to your last one is no. Okay. <laughs> uh, they uh, are you they, listening out there, media? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, Alan, for those of you who don't know, is a science writer, okay? So he's. But he's I do our not do guy. newspaper coverage in Key West. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's a job available. <laughs> I think one of the biggest steps that we took to control this problem was the addition of more domestic inspectors. And these are the inspectors that go house to house. Um, we added four more people in Key West itself. So right now we have 13 people that are on Key West trying to eliminate any containers, treat any containers that, that they might come across, um, and hopefully educate residents as they go. Um, you know, as for the situation right now, um, Director Fussell was talking about the, the incidents, how we wanted to be around 2%. 
Well, Monday and Tuesday of last week, I looked at all of the inspections throughout all of Key West, and we were still at about 11% of all the homes. And this is November we're talking about. Um, so still we don't have the cooperation that, that we need to really control this. So uh, Egypti is, or Egyptus, uh, is, is not the only dengue vector, right? There's Albopictus is a is a candidate as well. Is that right? We don't have albopictus in the Keys. You don't? No. <laughs> okay, so that's not a problem. We have a question up here in the audience. Huh. Yeah, I was wondering if you were working with the schools at all down there to like educate the public. Do you have any collaboration with the schools? Yes, um, we go to all the, the schools throughout all the Keys. I think there's about, there's three high schools down there um, and then a number of elementary and middle schools. We have a biologist that goes to them full time basically and talks to almost every single class as well as participates in any sort of education days and truck days, um, that type of thing, just to, to let all the students know and hopefully they would take that home to their parents. But yes, we do, we do try to get the schools as involved as possible. So do, do you still um, check mosquitoes for the presence of the virus and if so, what what, as of today, is there any dengue in any of the mosquitoes? Um, let's see, Dr. Eisern, did she hear that question? <laughs> Could you repeat the question? I'm wondering if there's dengue in mosquitoes today in, in Key West. Um, so we've been surveilling the mosquitoes that um, uh, Key West has been sending us frozen mosquitoes that we um, uh, look for whether or not dengue is present. We've had so far three positive hits, um, not recently, but uh, total positive hits, and they have all been the same serotype. There's four different types of dengue, so we keep finding one, which is the the same as the human cases. Which serotype is that? Uh, serotype one. Serotype one. Mm -hmm. So, so far just the one, um, but we haven't gotten anything in the most recent um, pools that we've looked at. How do you assay the mosquitoes? So um, actually we have one of our um, lab persons here, I don't know if she's, there's Amanda Graham. So she basically takes the frozen mosquitoes and homogenizes them. And she's figured out that they're actually really hard to, to break apart. And we had some mosquitoes grow in the lab that we were using to determine control conditions for how to homogenize. And it ended up that the ones from the Keys were pretty hardy, so we had to get a pretty hefty instrument to homogenize. Then she isolates the nucleic acids, she looks for the genome of the virus. Um, it's an RNA genome, so she reverse transcribes it into C uh, DNA, and then using the right PCR primers amplifies um, different segments of dengue and looks to see if there are one, two, three, or four, and she can identify which type. So now you're still getting positive. You still got positive mosquitoes relatively recently. Um, that would imply that there have been more human cases of the disease, right? Uh, yes, we've gotten them um, probably within the last. The, uh, 1027, so late October was the last time that we got a positive hit. But this is a, a surveillance effort, so you have to actually um, screen a lot of mosquitoes to find your positive hits, but it's still apparently in the mosquito population. The last um, positive case, I believe the onset date was October 30th. So we haven't had any human confirmed cases after that one. Okay, so maybe you guys are doing a really good job. <laughs> we got a question here. Uh, no, we need uh, we need you on this to get the. Oh, how many human cases have you found dengue in? There have been sixty confirmed cases this year and twenty seven in two thousand nine. So we're all. Are, I'm I'm interested in the number. How many of these might be asymptomatic? Were all those symptomatic cases? Those were all symptomatic and confirmed through the health department. Um, another thing to consider too, you know, the health department will only test people for free if they were there are the first five days of the illness so someone comes to them two weeks after and they're already feeling better the health department would send them to their physician and it would be up to that person if they wanted to pay for the test or not so you're missing a lot of cases that way and again like you said um, you know 50 percent of people are asymptomatic so the number of confirmed cases really is just the tip of the iceberg so if now, can dengue transmit vertically in mosquitoes? It has been shown. My on that? It has been shown to to uh, be transmitted that way. Yes, um, we haven't seen that in the keys that we know of, but we really haven't been testing male mosquitoes or mosquito larvae, so we don't really know what's going on in the local population. So by vertical transmission, we mean the females wind up 
laying eggs that have the have the virus in them, and so the larvae grow up with the virus and could transmit that further. Mm -hmm. Pretty clever little virus. We have a question. Well, it was already answered, but I'll still ask it anyways. Yeah, you'll get a bumper sticker if you do. <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys mainly focus on the mosquitoes, but why don't you look at the larvae? Um, well, it's all a matter of, you know, we have only so much money in our budget and we can only do so much. Um, if we had unlimited funding, that would be a wonderful thing. Um, but unfortunately, we kind of have to pick and choose what we can and can't focus on, and our main focus is just on the control of the mosquito itself. So if we were to graph this event from the first dengue cases uh, a, a year or so ago through time, there was a what we could call an outbreak, is that correct? Where there was it came up and waned again, is that right? So where do we stand in and how do you see the future of this? Is this something that's going to, is this an incursion that's uh, going to spread in the southern United States, uh, in your opinion, or is this a, an outbreak that's going to peter out? I, th I think you're uh, looking at two si uh, separate situations here. You're looking at uh, what uh, we think will happen in the Keys, and then what uh, might happen, say, in Miami, okay. for example. And they may not be related. Okay. Now, one of the things that we have tried to do is concentrate our efforts. And uh, we have been successful in that. And uh, keeping the outbreak limited to a small area of Key West down in the Old Town area. And the, <clears throat> the Old Town area of Key West probably is one of the most ideal breeding sites for Aedes aegypti that you'll find almost anywhere. Uh, it's uh, just a lot of old homes with porches that are open for uh, resting and uh, uh, whatnot for the mosquitoes. Uh, a lot of gutters and uh, uh, homes very close together. A lot of trees and uh, vegetation. And uh, it's, it's just a, a, an ideal uh, situation there for them. Uh, we... And, but we have more resources than uh, Miami does. I mean, literally. And uh, our budget is probably uh, five, six times what uh, Miami Dade's is. And if, a, uh, they, if they had an outbreak, it would be more likely to turn into an epidemic than it would in the Keys. Now, what we uh, hope is going to happen uh, we just started here just uh, very recently. I think we had our first runs on it in August uh, using a new product. It's still BTI, but it's in a different formulation, and it's a, a powdered uh, form that you mix with water and apply it as a suspension. And <clears throat> we have been able to uh, get the best uh, coverage and kill of mosquito larvae that we have with anything that we have used so far. And we're doing it by aerial application, which gives us a, an opportunity to cover a lot of the area very quickly. So that's even uh, applicable in a situation like an old town in Key West? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that's where we've been uh, doing all of our testing. So you can get the gutters that way, I guess, mm -hmm. yes. right? <laughs> yeah. So, Amy, do you use helicopters for that? Yes. Yeah. We actually... Um, we hired a company to come in and do it, and, and when we did our trials in August and September to make sure that it was working and, and to get a look at their spray system. And then we just recently, in the last few months, that's what we've been working on, is putting this new spray system together and building it and putting it on the aircraft, along with a support truck, because you need to have the truck with the mixing tank and everything, mixing the water and the, and the BTI. Um, and then we had our first successful spray mission uh, two days ago, Saturday, we sprayed in the morning. So the, the, the initial cases, the index cases in this, these are people who had not traveled outside of Key West in the recent past. Where is this coming from? Do you know? Or any, <clears throat> what, any ideas? Well, one, <clears throat> once we get our initial uh, introduction, which uh, could come from anywhere in the Caribbean because dengue is scattered throughout the Caribbean, and uh, it's, it's essentially next door to us. And once that it gets uh, 
uh, uh, into the uh, uh, into Key West, and then uh, that person becomes viremic, and uh, uh, when the mosquito bites the viremic person and take and picks up the virus, and then starts spreading it uh, to uh, the, the people, other people in the area, and it just spreads. So from I guess that. it's. So you basically you're saying it's sufficiently established so we don't have to worry about where it came from anymore. That's it's right. Here. Okay. That's right. And since uh, uh, probably less than half the people that are infected are symptomatic, right. then you you never know. Right. So with with polio, it's possible to um, track the spread of viruses. So we know, for example, the epidemic of polio in the Congo originated from Angola and before that from India. Can you do that with dengue? Probably is a question for Sharon. Can you do sequences and track exactly where isolates came from? Um, actually not quite sure how to answer that question. I mean, you can, um, you can certainly sequence the genome to try to track it. That's try to figure out where it's been introduced from. So whether it's coming, I guess, similarly from either the Caribbean, as Ed mentioned, or maybe coming from a traveler or from mosquitoes coming from Asia, it might be, there, there might be ways of figuring out, looking at phylogenetic analysis so to... Is, is there enough genetic drift in the, in the virus so that you could do that kind of, We just did a TWIV uh, last week about, um, Looking at a, a right sequence cases. sequence drift in HIV yeah, yeah sequence drift in HIV allowing you to track transmission of the virus uh, in in criminal cases and we're wondering then whether the sequence drift is sufficient so that uh, you could track the uh, migration if you like of the virus. So so far, um, the, the the first sequence that was looked at was only a partial genome sequence. So it wasn't the full genome sequence, just the envelope. So I. Um, it looks like it might be closer to Mexican. Yeah, I, the health department did some work last year sequencing, and it was the 2007 Mexican strain. Um, you know, whether that tells us anything, I'm not really sure, because I believe you can find that throughout the Caribbean as well. Mm -hmm. And do we know anything about the Miami isolate in that sense, where, what the origin of that might have been? I actually don't have any information on, I know it's a different serotype than what's been found in the Keys, but I don't know if the media has, if it's gotten out to which serotype it is. I just know that it's not Dengue 1. Is there, it's not Dengue 1. It is not. I believe it is 2. 4? Okay, 4. It's Dengue 4. Dengue 4. Great. So this is, uh, I mean, not great. So this is, for okay. those who are not tuned into this, this is significant because, uh, uh, as we've said before, there's two major, two forms of dengue. One is when you get infected the first time can be a fairly, usually a fairly mild disease, dengue fever, but if you get infected by one serotype and then a second serotype, uh, you can get a more serious disease, dengue hemorrhagic fever, uh, and that's a bummer. So when you have two serotypes circulating, uh, you've got a bigger problem. Now, does it matter which two serotypes it is? We were talking about uh, this. No, just again. as long as it's a different one than the initial one from which the, the person got okay. a, a, um, a response against. And so then you can get uh, increased, uh, the worsened or enhanced disease symptoms the second time around. Okay, so the notion that the Miami case is not the same serotype as what was in Key West is, is a big red flag. Probably not a good thing because that means that we, we uh, have two circulating strains right. and so it's very possible that uh, an individual can be infected with mosquitoes that have the different the two strains that are, have been found. So there is also well, and it also implies that this is, this is likely to happen again. I mean, if we got back-to-back -back two different serotypes in Key West and Miami, then where's the next one going to be and what's it going to be? Correct. There is also a locally acquired case in Broward that was a different serotype than those two as well. It was serotype three. So now we have three. Okay. Sounds like yeah. Miami mosquito control needs more money. <laughs> Did you have a question? I'm sure they're that? accepting We have a question here. Um, so dengue is normally a tropical disease, but how far north can Aedes aegypti breed and transmit dengue? Southeastern U.S. Uh, is primarily the, uh, the area that we'd be concerned with. And just how far up that'll go? Uh, I would say uh, probably up to uh, Virginia, maybe something like that. And we had mentioned Aedes albopictus um, also can transmit the disease, and that goes all the way up the entire eastern seaboard. So 
really, it could happen anywhere. Now, we've, we've had two cases of hemorrhagic fever this year. The first case we had uh, this year was a hemorrhagic fever. And um, then the, later on, we had another. And <clears throat> so far as we can uh, determine, uh, both uh, cases had been exposed uh, earlier to uh, one of the other uh, serotypes. Sharon, can you get hemorrhagic fever if, from just one serotype, or does it really take two? Uh, as far as I understand, it, it seems like it takes the second one is, is where you start getting those symptoms. Okay. I'm not absolutely sure. So, right. Um, yeah, it was just uh, especially with children that have had um, the antibodies from the mom, and so they they have already an existing antibody in their system, and then they get infected for the first time with dengue, but um, now it, it could be the second hit. So the presence of hemorrhagic fever is basically clinical verification of circulation of two strains, two serotypes. We have a question here? Yeah, you, you uh, a little bit earlier were talking about where uh, where does this dengue come from in Key West. Have you done any looking at any seroconversion rates of the resident population? And so. What did you find and what do you think that means? The health department and CDC were involved in a zero survey of the population in 2009. Um, and what they did is they did a mile radius around the index case location um, and found that about 5% of the residents had had recent infections uh, with dengue virus. Um, they, there hasn't been any sort of zero survey outside of that area. So I, I can't really tell you for all of Key West what it is, um, but just that area that we already knew the virus was circulating in. That was 5% of the residents? Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty big number. It I is, mm -hmm. yes. So do you have any sense um, if the... So I, I assume that in response to the identification of dengue cases in Key West, you, you intensified your operations, mosquito control operations. Do you have any way of knowing whether that was effective at limiting virus propagation? Well, <clears throat> we would like to think that it uh, at least limited the spread of it. Um, but it wasn't nearly as effective as we had hoped it would be. And uh, I think that if uh, uh, well, we're putting a, a lot of our hope on uh, this new uh, larviciding uh, program with the new formulation of BTI. Uh, otherwise, I think that uh, it would have uh, eventually uh, spread up the keys. It, there, there's much uh, movement of people up and down the keys and from the keys to Miami, from Miami down the keys and whatnot. That it's, it's, uh, it's a wonder that it hasn't already uh, spread uh, into uh, Miami. What's the advantage of the of the liquid form of the larvicide uh, relative to the pellet form? Because they're the same bug, right? Yeah. Uh, the The main difference, and I last year I wanted to use the uh, granular form. We we use uh, uh, well, hundreds of thousands of pounds of the uh, granules each year for our salt marsh mosquitoes, and I wanted to use that. But uh, we started running into resistance uh, right away because people don't want the granules in their pools. And, <laughs> and there are a lot of open air restaurants in uh, Key West and people don't want the granules falling into their food as they're dining outdoors. Uh, so that sort of ruled that out. And then there was a liquid formulation that is used, I think, primarily by the Forest Service that uh, spotted cars very badly and it was difficult to clean off. So uh, that was a, a problem, and it was only uh, recently. Uh, I think that this product has had some limited use overseas. I believe they've tried it in Australia in some tests. But to give you an idea of the <clears throat> uh, the sales of it, the largest container that it was available in was a one-pound container. And uh, so it was only when we got that, and it, you mix it with the water, and we apply it. The first applications were three quarters of a pound mixed with a half a gallon of water to an acre. And then the, the, the operation we did on Saturday, we dropped it down to a half pound and a half gallon of water to an acre. And uh, we got the same results, uh, killing the larvae, as we got with the three quarters. So we, we know that we, we can probably come down even more. So it's, it's pretty efficient. 
Yeah, very efficient. And uh, one of the advantages of, of this uh, product over the, uh, the granular material is this seems to leave a residual that may be good for up to uh, maybe 10 days or two weeks. And that is a real uh, advantage uh, there. If it, if it uh, is deposited on leaves and on foliage, uh, then when the uh, water evaporates, then the powder is left there on the leaf. When it rains, then it's, it's washed off into any containers that might be underneath that. Uh, and when we apply it by air, uh, it gets in the gutters uh, too, and uh, that takes care of that problem. And also, just flat rooftops are a problem for a uh, mosquito breeding. So my sense is that that uh, a large fraction of the population are basically germaphobes, and they figure any bacterium is bad. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So do you get flack from the population because you're spraying bacteria all over their town? Or do they just know it as a, an insecticide? Well, you always have a few people that will call and uh, be mad about anything that you're doing. Um, anybody in mosquito control can tell you that you definitely cannot please everybody. Um, but I think that the majority of the population understands the importance and supports us. Okay. Just tell them it's not, it's not the bacteria. It's a toxin that you're spraying. That'll make them feel bad. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's true. Yes. Yeah, I had a question um, while I'm surrounded by all these um, experts in the room. I did quite a lot of research on dengue because my daughter, who lives in St. Thomas, contracted dengue fever in September, and she was very, very ill. And when she was well enough to fly, she did flow, fly home, and I nursed her <laughs> back to health. She's still, still recovering. Um, but my question is, which I did not find in the in in my research, but that's internet research, so you know how that goes. Googling this and that um, is that you talked about um, that she now that she has the virus, she she carries it, she can carry it to her unborn child, and that would if if the child ever had uh, contracted dengue, it would be you're saying maybe the hemorrhagic um, dengue, and if she gets it again. It could be hemorrhagic if she got another uh, type or if, if she got the same strain. So, yeah, I just wanted to hear about that. Thank you. So she, she's not going to pass on the virus itself. What she's going to pass on are her maternal antibodies. So the antibodies, so if she breastfeeds or just right after birth, she gives the maternal antibodies to her infant. If that infant then gets um, exposed to dengue, then if it happens to be the same serotype, then there's not a problem. Um, the baby would be protected, but if it's a second serotype, it may lead to um, enhanced symptoms, so the other things that we talked about. So it only, it's only if it's a ser second serotype. Now again, she's not going to pass the virus, just her own immune response against the virus, as if she had had a vaccine against dengue. So it's, it's the same principle as vaccine, you just have the antibody response. But those maternal antibodies wane over time, right? They will so wane over time. There's a window in time when that's going to Right, so as long as she's issue. breastfeeding, um, that will continue, and then they will eventually wane over time. And just so to, to finalize this, the, the, oh, they love St. Thomas. The only reason they are moving home next summer when she's through uh, with her, her teaching this uh, her commitment this year but uh, is because of dengue fever. <laughs> there, It's really epidemic um, in the Virgin Islands, and it's pretty scary. Tell her not to move to Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wes. Yeah, there's a... Uh, right there, sure. Uh, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, the BTI, does it only uh, basically destroy the larvae or does it also affect the mature mosquitoes? Only the larvae. It, and it has to be uh, consumed by the larvae. And <clears throat> we, have, we only have about uh, 48 hours, maybe 72 in some cases, to uh, once we find the larvae to get the material out there before they go into their fourth uh, instar, or the, which is their last stage of development as a larva, <clears throat> and they stop eating and then, then go into their pupil stage. Uh, what happens, and it's a very uh, specific uh, product uh, for uh, mosquitoes, the uh, uh, bacteria will release a toxin and that's what kills the mosquito larvae. But the toxin is only released at a very specific pH. And that pH is found in a mosquito gut. And that uh, the same pH is not, uh, not found 
uh, so far as we know, in uh, anything except, say, mosquitoes, midges, black flies, and maybe one or two other uh, species. Where did this bacterium originally come from? Was it a natural mosquito pathogen or an insect pathogen? The, the, the bacteria. Where the bacteria. It it's a, it's a, a just a a, a natural uh, a naturally occurring bacteria that uh, is found uh, throughout the world, and this particular strain was found in Israel, and that's where the eye comes from on the. Uh, so uh, the was it initially BTA. isolated from mosquitoes or some other insect? It's a soil bacteria. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Do you uh, see the mosquitoes becoming resistant to any of your uh, insecticides? We have we, actually you go ahead. We have actually observed resistance um, starting to some of our insecticides that we use. Um, that's why we do resistance monitoring the way that we do and try to rotate our chemicals as much as possible. Um, the only resistance we've seen has been in the adulticide chemicals. There, we have not observed any resistance in the larvicides that we use. Yeah, BT resistance turns out, this is something that's been looked at a lot in the biotech industry because it's the same toxin that's used in, um, in transgenic plants, um, like transgenic corn that's insecticidal. Um, and it, it can occur under laboratory conditions, but it's been very, very rare in the field, apparently. Um, it's just not an easy thing to evolve resistance to. Yeah, in a recent issue of Science, um, they talked about releasing a genetically modified sterilized male mosquito. I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. We have a, a test uh, schedule for this coming May on that. We've been working very closely with uh, uh, the, the uh, developer of, of this product. As a matter of fact, we have a, a teleconference uh, tomorrow uh, with them on it. It's uh, developed in the UK, <clears throat> and uh, we we think that we we if we can get the population of the uh, 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 Aedes aegypti down to a, a, a certain level, which would be a very low level, at just what it would be uh, uh, number-wise. I don't think anybody knows, but uh, uh, let's say that uh, we could end up with uh, maybe 5% of the, the numbers that we currently have uh, now in the wild. <laughs> then release these uh, genetically modified uh, uh, adults, and you would release them as uh, ad adult males, that <clears throat> when they mate with a wild female, uh, that uh, female only mates once. So that ends uh, her productive life. The offspring from that uh, uh, union, uh, they will all die. Both males and females will die. And now they, they had it so that uh, only the females would die, but then they, uh, they were able to uh, manipulate that and have it so that they, both male and female offspring would die. So you keep releasing the uh, manipulated uh, uh, males and they keep mating with the uh, wild females and pretty soon uh, theoretically you uh, they're no more if you think uh, and we, this, this but, approach except for the transgenic part this approach has actually been used in the past the sterile insect technique um, and and has been successful in eradicating at least locally eradicating um, some insects I, I think probably the most uh, uh, significant uh, use of that was a screwworm fly in the southeast uh, yep. and uh, for a fraction <clears throat> of the cost of uh, the eradication these the savings was uh, many times that each year after that yeah uh, Alan knows a bit about that screwworm story right yeah, my um, Ed Nippling who directed that research was a colleague of my grandfather's uh, at the USDA um, so I was very familiar with that story. That's good. We had that question on our agenda, so thanks. And, you know, if you think you have trouble with the press now, where do you start releasing mosquitoes? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, in so, fact, this, this company, Oxitec, uh, is the company you're dealing with, I yeah. assume. They're the same right. ones who have been in a little bit of hot water about the release they just did on the Caymans, which was somewhat poorly publicized. Right. Well, they did it on the sly, I think. That was the problem. Well, there's debate about whether it was done on the sly. According to the company, they announced it in advance, but uh, 
according to some folks who saw the PR materials, they, they announced that they were doing the sterile insect release, but they didn't explain that these were transgenic sterile insects, yeah. um, which shouldn't make a huge difference, but in the public mind, it, it does. Well, some of them are afraid that uh, if we uh, eliminate uh, a species of mosquito, that's going to have an impact on the ecology and uh, it's going to upset uh, the uh, food chain. And how, do you, how do you respond to that? I mean, because you know something about insect ecology. Is that hold water, that argument? Well, uh, my general response is that we, in all the mosquito control efforts that have been done, we have never uh, eradicated a single species of mosquito. So, eradication is unlikely anyway. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, okay. Have it's a controlled. question up there? Yeah. Um, I was wondering if the BTI has any adverse effect on people, like if they're immunocompromised or in large amounts. Because I know as a kid, we used to think it was fun to chase the fog truck with the bikes. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as BTI goes, there are no effects on humans. Um, I don't know what was in those fog trucks you were chasing, but that might be another story. <laughs> How are you feeling? You feeling okay? <laughs> So I, we actually posed a theoretical question some time ago on Twitter, but we didn't have any experts. Now that we have mosquito experts, here's a theoretical question. If you could wipe out all the mosquitoes in the world, and I know you can't, but let's say you could, would anybody care? Would it have any effect on the ecosystem? I would care because I'd be out of a job. <laughs> okay. No, I, I, I'm sure that, uh, that, that some people would uh, look at it as being a, 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 a very unsound uh, thing to do because of the, uh, the uh, organisms and other uh, insects that to feed on uh, mosquito larvae. And uh, the dragonfly is probably the uh, best example of a, a good uh, predatory uh, insect, in my opinion, because the uh, larvae of the dragonfly feed on mosquito larvae, and the adult of the dragonfly feeds on mosquito adults. So that's a... Uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, so it sounds like it, it's, it's not unlikely that it would introduce some imbalance, okay, because they are part of the ecosystem. Yeah, uh, there's always an adjustment in uh, and the uh, biological uh, uh, life of uh, if if they lose one source of uh, uh, food, they'll go to another, and if one habitat is disturbed, they'll go to another. They they will adjust uh, uh, to it just like people uh, adjust. Uh, and uh, so, you're saying if we run out of oil, we'll we'll find something else. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> solar, solar panels out there. <laughs> Well, and you can make this argument with uh, with campaigns that have successfully eradicated an insect from an area, like the screwworm fly. Um, you know, there probably were adjustments in the ecosystem in response to that, but I I don't recall the world ending. And that's right. My question just had um, to do with you spoke a little bit about uh, chikungunya virus and a possible uh, upcoming outbreak about that, and a strong worry for that. I know that also uh, it, utilizing the 80s mosquito as a primary vector, what um, do you believe is a cause for a possibility of an uprise of this, uh, of an outbreak uh, of this virus? And do you think it has any effect, or do you think that uh, global climate change has any effect on this uh, upcoming outbreak that you may perceive to become? I don't know. There's probably people here that know more about global uh a change of uh, warming and whatnot than than I do, but uh, it's it's difficult to uh, predict. Uh, I, I, they talk about the uh, rising of the uh, the oceans and flooding areas. Uh, that uh, that may happen, but uh, I would uh, guess that uh, in the case of mosquitoes, they'd probably head for higher ground. Everything would be relative. Uh, that then the high ground now would be low ground uh, then and. Uh, they, they, they would adjust. In, insects are, are probably uh, the, one of the most adaptive things there is to uh, changes in the environment. Yes? Um, so have any other methods of biocontrol been considered, um, like releasing predatory arthropods to control the adult mosquitoes? 
No, we haven't um, done any sort of control for adults when it comes to biologicals. However, we do use mosquito fish, gambusia, um, quite often. And um, that's mainly our, our source of biological control are those fish because they do live very well basically in any container you put them. We put them in drains, we put them in cisterns which are large areas that hold water um, under the old homes. Um, we put them pretty much anywhere and, and haven't had a problem. They do a great job. Any other questions from the audience? Anything from you, Rich, before yeah, we move on? Cool. All right, let's move on to a few emails. Uh, I've chosen a few here at the outset that we might, might interest the uh, mosquito control group. And the first is from Scott. He writes, I am based in Hong Kong and there has been a local outbreak of dengue among the international community here. This is the first local transmission of dengue in seven years. Several students at my children's school have taken off of school with apparent dengue symptoms such as rash and muscle pain. So there you go, another part of the world where there is an outbreak. Is Hong Kong uh, one of the places where you would expect to find outbreaks of dengue? I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Uh, uh, dengue is pretty pretty much limited to tropical, subtropical right. areas, and uh, I, I don't know. Uh, Hong Kong uh, is is not, in my opinion, uh, I, I've been there a couple of times, and I don't recall seeing very many uh, palm trees and things <laughs> of that sort uh, there. Uh, but. Um, I, I, I really don't have any idea what the uh, uh, population of uh, 80s Egypti or 80s yeah. Albopictus might be uh, there. Well, they do. Uh, there's an article here in a uh, which he sent us a link to in the Manila, in a Manila website, and he said most of the cases, 43 cases in 2009, were all classified as imported into Hong Kong. So they're coming from areas where dengue is endemic, I presume. Um, so there's probably not endemic transmission. Well, we've seen an increase, especially this year, in dengue throughout the world, um, case number-wise. Mm -hmm. um, here in Florida, we've had 123 imported cases of dengue, you know, to go with the 62 locally acquired. Right. So we've really seen a rise in, in dengue all over the place. Why do you think that's happening? <sighs> Your guess is as good <laughs> as ours. Um, you know, international travel. I don't know if you know weather-wise what it was like. If it was, it was um, you know more more rain this year, higher temperatures, and it was more. Are we also are we monitoring more closely? What was that? Monitoring. Are we? Yeah, absolutely. Right, Dick de Pommier says that with increased population, there are more opportunities for containers to be filled with water. People discard their food containers where they spread into areas where they haven't lived before and make more standing water, basically. So that's probably a part of it as well. Yeah, I mean, you have to look at this as kind of a man-made issue. It's our containers that are out in the yards. Um, if there weren't containers, they do still, mosquitoes breed in tree holes and the bromeliads that fill with water. Um, but really, the majority of what you see is, is something that someone's discarded or just hasn't taken care of in their own yard. So it really comes back on the population themselves as to if they really want to take it seriously or not. Um, he ends up by writing, after listening to TWIV number three, that's the TWIV dengue episode, I feel much more informed about dengue. Even though you are now in the 100s, it would be great if you could continue to occasionally produce educational podcasts. I really appreciate these episodes. So that's from Scott from Hong Kong. Peter is from Germany and he writes, Gentlemen, I thought this might be interesting for you since chikungunya was at least glanced a few times in TWIV. Sadly though, the blog post itself is in German. So he sent the link to a blog post in a German paper uh, talking about the spread of chikungunya in Germany. Now, which chikungunya, which we've talked about, has spread globally since it the virus changed to be able to grow in uh, 80s Albopictus, which has a global range, of course. It's spreading its way through Europe. He says, it seems that many factors are at work here. Travelers brought 80s Albopictus to southern Europe. Uh, the chikungunya virus successfully adapted to that new host. 
Climate change opens up new habitats for the insect. This should be an interesting progress to watch. So we sent a few links, which we'll put in the show notes. Uh, before I found TWIV, that is before TWIV number one, I didn't know much about virology. Yes, I knew that it's an interesting field, but accessible knowledge wasn't widely accessible for a layman like me. Now, not only do I know about the virus, I also know about the vector and can watch it get closer to where I live. I haven't seen Aedes albopictus here, close to Frankfurt in Germany, but according to the maps, it's creeping up the Rhine Valley, which is no surprise since the upper Rhine Valley is the warmest part of the country. It's going to be interesting to see how the distribution will change in the next 10 or so years. Thanks for the education you provide. There's so much in it from the beautiful intricacy of the biochemical interaction between virus and host to the real life implications of an insect carrying it to new parts of the world. So thanks, Peter from Germany. And as we've mentioned before, chikungunya is on the move. And uh, Ed thinks it's only a matter of time before it comes to the US. Certainly the mosquito is widespread. You mentioned before that there's no albopictus in the, in the keys, right? Right. Do we understand that? <clears throat> well, they have uh, gotten into the keys at different times but in isolated uh, spots. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, it, when this happens, we go in there and just literally knock the heck out of them. And uh, we eliminate uh, that uh, uh, foci there. And, uh, and we, uh, we've done that about uh, maybe a half a dozen times in the last uh, 10, 12 years. Is their breeding behavior different? Do they lay eggs in the water? Or is no, they, they're very similar to uh, Aedes okay. aegypti. Okay. So the control and measures are similar. Tires are the main thing. Uh, for, for, they, they seem to prefer uh, tires uh, as, a, as a place. And that's the way they got into uh, this country, mm -hmm. through uh, tires that were being brought back for reconditioning from Japan. Uh, but they, they will also breed in uh, places like tree holes. Uh, they have a little wider uh, area and will travel a little further from uh, uh, the homes and whatnot uh, around the area. And, uh, but uh, I have heard uh, from uh, one of the entomologists with CDC that uh, they had observed uh, an aerial uh, spray application for uh, adults and they were able to get good control of uh, Albopictus adults by aerial spraying, which is greatly different than uh, you would get with Aedes aegypti. Our next email is from Jim, who writes, I found your podcast several weeks ago on iTunes. I really enjoy it. I learned to love science, biology, and more specifically immunology back in the late 70s and early 80s. I had a very heavy dose of microbiology because in those days, immunology was a part of the microbiology departments where I studied. Anyway, your podcast reminds me of that time and my abiding respect for those who can do science. I was too impatient. I loved the ideas of science, but not the doing of science. The book that got me interested in science was titled The Eighth Day of Creation. I am on podcast number eight or nine and look forward to many interesting hours ahead. I did skip ahead and listen to your last podcast yesterday and was pleased to hear that you had discussed retroviruses in one of your previous podcasts. I do not know whether it is appropriate to describe retroviruses as way cool, but the idea of them certainly is to me. My coworkers think I am a bit nuts when I start telling them about the polio vaccine and why there was an outbreak recently in Africa, as you guys predicted. And also, congratulations in predicting the avian virus would not be the cause of the next flu pandemic, but that more likely H1N1 would be the cause. Thanks a lot for your work and your contributors. So speaking of H1N1, you mentioned the problems that you have, the Mosquito Control Division with the press and them appreciating uh, what you're doing and saying that you just want to get more money. That's why you make a big deal of it. It's the same thing with the flu vaccine manufacturers. The, many of the public say they're just uh, they're trying to make money by pushing this flu vaccine, which we really don't need. And of course, that is not true at all. So many aspects of infectious diseases have the same problems. And I think it's because they're not understood. And that's why we do this in the end. Our next email is from Alfred, uh, who is a physician in the emergency department in Camden, New Jersey not far from me. Uh, Alfred writes, a bit behind on my listening, but the question came up a few episodes back 
why an endogenous retrovirus does not seem to become active and replicate. So many, of, uh, many animals in their genomes have endogenous retroviruses which do not replicate. They are just copied along with the genome, but they don't make infectious viruses. My question would be the opposite. Is there any advantage to the virus becoming active again? If the goal of viral infection is to propagate its genome, then what better way to do it than to incorporate it into the genome of a successfully reproducing organism? Once the genome is in the germ cell line, each time the organism reproduces, the genome is reproduced. Any activation of the genome in that organism is going to lead to an infection in the organism. This will force the organism to divert resources to support the growth of the virus and to the development of an immune response to the viremia. Both of these may decrease the organism's chances of successful reproduction and decrease further passage of the virus's genetic material. I can think of two instances that might justify activation of the virus. One, if having the endogenous retroviral genome leads to a mild infection, then activation and communication of the virus might weaken competitors without the endogenous virus and give the organism with the ERV a reproductive advantage. Two, if the ERV has some type of monitor to recognize when an organism is dying, or stressed beyond reproductive capacity, the virus would benefit by becoming active again and transmitting its genome to other organisms through more traditional means. I know of some trees that only go to seed when the tree is stressed, but I'm sure there are other examples of infectious processes that bail out when their hosts no longer appear, vi appear viable. You guys are still the best podcast on the web. Keep up the great work. Well, you never get yeah, he is. <laughs> uh, for those of you who haven't listened to Twit much, Alfred uh, is an ER physician, and he's seen some cases of rabies in the ER. We've had an ongoing dialogue with him uh, about that. It's a very rare disease to see in most parts of the U.S., and it's not easy to pick up. And as he's told us before, usually when people come to the ER and they present with rabies symptoms, we just think they're on drugs and we send them home. But uh, it's very difficult to diagnose. So these are very good points. I mean, an, an uh, endogenous retrovirus has an advantage because it's reproduced along with the genome. So that's all it needs, right? It doesn't have to make particles. And there are many examples of endogenous retroviruses that do that. Uh, but as he said, you, if they're activated, it would kill the host. But then there are many endogenous retroviruses that have evolved for many, many years in the host. And even when they replicate, they don't cause disease. So for example, there are many mouse endogenous retroviruses that replicate and don't cause any disease in the animal. So the, the different ways that viruses coexist with hosts are, are highly varied. And what I've learned in the end is just no one way that's successful. Whatever way works for the particular virus-host combination, that's the one that persists. Uh, the next one is from Ken. He writes, your netcast is one of the highest quality science netcasts available and my favorite. I was wondering if you have any advice for people in science who would like to follow in your footsteps. Netcasts are an amazing tool for education, both to an expert audience and the general public. However, I have noticed that there is a distinct lack of health-related netcasts that are both evidence-based and accessible to non-experts. Several popular health netcasts are dedicated to naturalistic or homeopathic medicine, complete with stores selling their cures and a general disregard for science. Scientists and physicians need to use this form of media to provide a rational voice that is friendly to lay people and covers pertinent topics. I will likely be attending medical school next year and was thinking of starting a netcast and interviewing available experts. Thoughts or suggestions? And then he adds that he was going to interview at Columbia in, the, in late October. And uh, any chance I could meet uh, either of you. But of course, since we read the, the email so late, it's too late to meet him because October is well gone. I wonder if we got him. Well, I don't know. Yes, my Al. suggestion would be um, you're probably not going to have much time, at least in the first two years of medical school. So you might want to put off the netcast a little while. I totally agree. I think he's not, he probably doesn't realize how much time it's going to take in medical school. It's a great idea. As you know, Alan, at, at PNS, the medical students put on uh, musicals, right? They have a theater troupe and they find time to do that. So maybe he can find an hour 
or two a month to do a netcast. Yeah, but it's different. I mean, a, a musical they'll put on, it's a couple of rehearsals and then they do the show. A netcast, it's a, every week you've got to be at it, whether you've got a final exam or not. So, Although if he could sit down uh, every few weeks and just record his thoughts about medical school on his own, that could be interesting. Could be. Useful to future, future medical Conversations students. Conversations with his fellow medical students. Or right. that too, sure. Yeah. yeah. That's useful. But the idea of getting into ex experts, you have to prepare and it takes time. I think it's a great idea and he's absolutely right that we need more of these, but I think he should wait because you do want to become a physician. Otherwise your parents will get upset <laughs> if you flunk out of medical school. Okay, one more email. This is from Judy. Um, hi guys, nice to have the three of you back together again. I guess this is when Dixon came back a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, but there's four. Yeah. Well, okay. we're way behind on our email. <laughs> you were discussing textbooks. I think we had a discussion about textbook becoming electronic at some point. A pet peeve of mine, I am a high school science teacher in California. Our textbooks are large, expensive, poorly written doorstops that don't even really follow the California state standards. So if the publishers are kowtowing to us in California, I feel really sorry for teachers in the smaller states. But there is an interesting change coming, the Common Core Standards, and she provides a link for this organization. The state governors started this movement, supported by ideas of change with the Obama presidency. Forty states have ratified that they will adopt and use the Common Core Standards, unifying what information students should get in K-12 education. Once kids are all t to be taught the same thing, publishers will put money into online and virtual texts and classes. It is moving that way now, but to have digital texts and online classes, kids need to have iPads or netbooks. Right now, the only thing we can spend textbook money on is books, physical paper books. So laws will have to change to bring education into the 21st century. I was listening to NPR and National Public Radio Freakonomics, radio podcast, I think, and I heard the following. If we went back in time 100 years, we would recognize very little except the classroom with one teacher and 30 kids. Like here, right? <laughs> Scary. I have hope we will apply all the things we know now about how the brain learns and the conditions we need for learning to occur. Thanks for all I learned from you and all the bad puns. That's, that's You're you. quite welcome. Yes. <laughs> so that's, cue, uh, Alan. that's great. I mean, she's right. Things are really, in, in terms of teaching, are still at a point where they were a hundred years ago, and now we have so much that we can do. It doesn't seem to percolate down. We we're just talking in the car driving down here today how we can do this netcast because of technology. We, if we didn't have the internet, if we didn't have Skype. We couldn't do it. It would be very difficult. So it's enabled by technology, and I think you need to take advantage of that. And that's what we're trying to do to push learning forward. And schools have to do the same thing, but it's, it's very difficult. I think we were talking about electronic books on iPads, but yep. there, are, there are significant barriers. OK, let's do a few science picks of the week. Let's start with you, Rich Condit. OK, so my pick is? A, um, a book that was actually used in one of our courses for first year students. It was sort of an orientation course. It's a Cold Spring Harbor publication called At the Bench, a Laboratory Navigator, updated edition by Kathy Barker. Actually, it occurs to me that this might be particularly appropriate for this uh, audience, for anybody who might be going to graduate school or uh, whatever. So this is you know, when I went to graduate school, they just kind of threw me in and said, okay, figure it out. And uh, this is written by a person who was uh, frustrated with uh, that experience and would have liked to have some sort of uh, formal orientation. So it's a, uh, it's a book uh, about uh, all of the basics in uh, getting oriented in a laboratory, just to read some from the table of contents. Uh, general lab organization procedures, laboratory setup and equipment, getting started and staying organized, how to set up an experiment, laboratory notebooks, presenting yourself and your data, making buffers and reagents, storage and disposal, working without contamination, eukaryotic cell culture, bacteria, DNA, RNA protein, radioactivity, centrifugation. Man, what a great chapter. I love centrifuges. 
<laughs> electrophoresis microscopy, okay? So it's uh, all the basics, including like be nice to your colleagues, right? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you run out of something, order it, right? That's right. That kind of stuff. Which never so, happens. I don't think a book, the book's not going to teach people to do that. Oh, I don't know. Read the book. Everybody's going to do it. Okay. okay. So at any rate, that's my pick. Uh, there's a review here on Amazon. I wish I had this information when I was a student. I so, wish I had this information when hey, I was a student. It sounds great. You were my student. <laughs> oh, <it's, laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you forget. You had all the information you needed. Yes, yes. <laughs> Just kidding. Alan, what have you got for us? Uh, mine is a, um, well, I'm a sucker for, for beautiful images of, uh, of nature, and this is the um, apparently the fourth annual running of this photo contest. It's uh, the organization is called Deep Indonesia. Uh, it's an underwater photo competition. And um, if you go online, you check out this site, the images are just absolutely stunning. Uh, they're from all over the world. It's not specifically Indonesia. Um, so uh, just really, really cool images all taken underwater, mostly by scuba divers. And uh, I don't know, I find this sort of stuff really cool. They are very pretty. They're really nice. We're looking at the uh, first three gold, silver, and bronze here. What on earth is that? Looks yeah. like some sort of squiddy thing. Yeah. The yellow one, yeah. Yeah. It's a, you should have set a, this up so we could project it, but it's, it's a, a blue, it's an eel. Blue ribbon. It's a blue ribbon eel. All right. Very cool. All right. Well, my pick is um, something sort of related to what Rich picked. This is a resource from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Mm -hmm. And they have many resources for people who want to learn science. We've picked some of them before. This one is called Resources for the Development of Early Career Scientists. So these are all free guides. They're available as PDFs, uh, a practical guide to scientific management for postdocs and new faculty, training scientists to make the right moves, and resources for scientific management training. So this is all in the line of what you picked, except they're free. They're at the HHMI website. And uh, you might find these useful if you're just starting out. Old guys like Rich and I, well, we couldn't change anyway. So I'll, I'll tell you, though, because this makes a lot of sense. This goes beyond, I think, the, the laboratory manual. Because you go to graduate school, you get your PhD, you go do a postdoc, OK? And then all of a sudden, they throw you in a laboratory, and they say, OK, set up the lab, get a grant, administer the grant, teach a course, do all that stuff, and you haven't been trained to do any of that stuff. And deal with all the people that come into your uh, laboratory. I was going to use a different word. Uh, the, all the people that come into your laboratory, you know, whining or upset or don't want to work or whatever. And you're not trained to do any of that stuff. So uh, a little guidance would be helpful. By the way, there is a Rich Condit Lab Guide, and it's on TWIV. And if you look hard, you will find it, and it is really funny. That's all I'm going to tell you. But you said we could post it, so okay. it's up yeah. there. So there are many ways you can listen to TWIP. By the way, any more questions before we wrap up this show? i got a couple of bumper stickers left. Those of you who did ask questions, <laughs> come down afterwards. I'll give them to you. Well, that's great. We had some nice questions. One more? OK. Well, while you're walking over there, uh, there's, we have a Facebook fan page, facebook.com slash thisweekinvirology, all one word. You can go there and check out what we're up to. We're taking videos and pictures on this road trip. We'll put them there, and you can interact us, with us in other ways as well. Uh, there are many ways to listen to TWIV. You can go to iTunes, the Zoom Marketplace, and if you do, please subscribe. And uh, leave a comment on iTunes if you haven't done so already. It helps us stay on the front page of the medical podcast directory, which we've been on for many, many months now. It's really great. You can also listen on your smartphone, uh, either an iPod, iPhone, uh, iPad type device, or an Android device with the Microbe World app. You can check that out at microbeworld.org. And you can also go to twiv.tv and listen or download the episodes and check out our show notes. Yes, we have a question. Yes, uh, earlier you said that there was a uh, case of a mixture of uh, dengue and chikungunya virus. Um, is there only one case of that, or are there have there been multiple cases found? That was Ed, right? You you mentioned the question. The case where there was a mixture of dengue and chikungunya. Has there been more than one case found? 
I'm only aware of one one case. Okay. I don't think there was any local transmission with that. That uh, person, <coughs> I believe, was a resident of Miami and had uh, been to India for about a month uh, on vacation. Just one, another one question. question. Another question. Those bumper stickers are big draws. <laughs> um, going back to the careers, um, how is the current field of virology and entomology, or is it just like a long, dark road that you have to really <laughs> love? <laughs> You want to start with entomology? Well, I kind of just fell into mine, um, luckily. Uh, I know that you here in the state of Florida that there have been quite a few openings with different mosquito control districts, so that's always an option to consider. Ed, you had, you've had a long career in medical entomology. If someone wanted to go into the field now, does it look good or bad for them? Well. I don't know. <laughs> to be quite, quite honest with you, uh, it depends on the individual as to what uh, you're uh, inclined to do. And I know when I was uh, uh, my first, uh, or during my junior year, when I thought I was uh, getting into my major, I was uh, going into education. And then I uh, had a job during the summer. <clears throat> doing a cotton insect survey and decided that on that I uh, went back uh, and I had already taken a, a basic course in entomology during my uh, junior year but uh, during my senior year I, I changed my major to uh, entomology and uh, then went into the Navy uh, shortly thereafter as an entomologist and spent uh, my entire time uh, there in uh, Medical Service Corps as a medical entomologist, uh, and uh, I, I, I tried extension work for uh, a year after I got out of college, and uh, I either had to join the military or they were going to draft me. So I, I decided to join and uh, got into a field that I uh, wanted to get into, and uh, I uh, stayed with it and, and liked it and. Uh, I, th I thought that uh, what I was in offered a lot of opportunities for what I wanted to do. And uh, there, there are a variety of things that will uh, lead you in one direction or another. And uh, I, d I don't think that you had to start collecting insects while you were still in diapers to want to be an entomologist. Uh, I think you can decide that uh, at a much uh, later time in, uh, in life. But uh, I, th I think that a lot of us, maybe most of us, uh, we end up in uh, a particular field because of circumstances uh, rather than a, a lifelong ambition. But I think it's a great field. I, uh, I, uh, I'm very satisfied with what I uh, did and what I've uh, been able to accomplish. And I think that uh, my last... Uh, I've been uh, down in the Keys now 13 years working in this mosquito control program and I think that's probably the most rewarding of any of my experiences because I can see immediate results and then having the, toward the end of my uh, uh, career before I retire uh, having this challenge to uh, come along to uh, really uh, bring out everything that I've uh, uh, learned uh, throughout the uh, years about uh, mosquito control. And I, uh, one of the things I learned is that uh, some of the things I learned didn't uh, do me much good And this. It was uh, taking a situation and uh, analyzing it and trying to, uh, to solve it. And uh, I think that we have uh, been quite successful in uh, and doing that and that's is one of the things that uh, gives you greater satisfaction I think than just about anything else and uh, realizing the ramifications of uh, finding a way to control uh, Aedes aegypti and it should work the same for Aedes albopictus and, uh, and possibly eliminate or re greatly reduce at the very least uh, diseases like uh, dengue.
And then, of course, the chikungunya that's been mentioned, that's uh, another uh, disease. Seems like all of the really great uh, diseases that we have originated in Africa. Uh, yellow fever, uh, dengue, uh, chikungunya, and uh, they're all very serious uh, diseases. And if you can uh, find a way to reduce the uh, occurrence of those diseases uh, and the impact it has on uh, 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 any particular population, uh, uh, I think that is a, a great reward for a life's endeavor. Well, virology is vibrant, and I'm sure Rich will, will agree. It's a great field. There's always something to do. There's plenty of places to be trained, and there's plenty to do. And with the technology we have now, you can do anything. Viruses aren't going away anytime soon. No. And but, by the way, everybody begins collecting viruses when they're still in diapers. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Even before, maybe. And the thing is, it's cool to, to find out why they make you sick, but there are a lot that don't and probably we need. And so that's going to be really interesting to sort out. So I think a career in virology is not for everyone, but if you... If I think one of the things you're hearing great. here from, from Ed and others is that, you know, do what you love. Um, yep. And uh, if you love it, uh, you're going to do well uh, in, in some way or another. And, you know, don't, uh, don't restrict yourself too much. Take whatever uh, comes along and just uh, and do what you love to do, and uh, it'll work out great. Alan, you want to say goodbye to us now? You have to go? Yes, I actually do have to go, but right. it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Alan is at alandove.com. Thanks for joining us. See you. Thank ya. you. See you, Alan. Bye. We have a question up here, yes. Uh, what made you want to start TWIV, and what do you hope to accomplish with TWIV in the future? Ah. Nice closing question, huh? Go for it, Vincent. <laughs> um, so I, I started listening to podcasts a few years ago uh, in my car. I have a very long commute, and I love them. I thought they were a great way to listen to what I wanted to listen to. And I heard someone say on a podcast that anyone can do a podcast. The technology is available to anyone, you can, and anyone can listen, and the cost is very low. But the most important thing is if you're passionate about something, you can do a podcast about it. And I, was, I am passionate about virology. So I said, I can do this. And I can teach the world virology. So that's why I started it. And Dixon de Pommier and I got going. Then um, Alan Dove and Rich Condit joined in. And now, in a given day, uh, about 1,000 downloads occur of different TWIV episodes. And that's more, in a week, that's more people than I've taught in my entire career. So we can teach thousands and thousands of people about viruses, which I think is really important. And I would like to expand this to, con to include other microbes. We now have this week in parasitism. In January, we're, we're starting a this week in microbiology. I'd like to make it live and video interactive so we could have questions along the way. So I have lots of plans to build this. And I think in different fields, scientists who enjoy teaching can use the same technology. So I can, I can um, act as a sort of uh, mentor for them as well. So that's the short version of why we did this. Uh, anything else? All right. And of course, everyone else can always send us their questions and comments to TWIV at twiv.tv. Rich Condit. Thank you for being here. Thanks for driving me today. Great. I look fine. This has been this has been really good. Terrific. This has been terrific. And you know what? I made a short version of your website, so now we can say it. You have this long URL for the University oh, yeah? of Florida. Bit bit.ly slash poxdoc. Far out. Bitly That's great. slash so poxdoc. If I do that, I can find myself. You can find yourself uh, online. So uh, Rich Condit, of course, is at the University of Florida. Home of the Gators, who had a lousy season this well, they're year. They're still the fighting Gators. They're just losing. I didn't fight very well this year. <laughs> <laughs> Bitly slash Poxdocs. Thanks so much. And all the bug guys and gals for key, from Key West. Ed, thank you so much for coming down. A we pleasure. appreciate it. Uh, Amy, thanks for flying them. <laughs> and yourself. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. And Andrea, thank you as well. It was thank great you. having you. And uh, made it a really special twiv. You can find them at keymos keysmosquito.org. Keysmosquito.org. And thanks to our great audience. We really appreciate it. And huge thanks to Professor Sharon Isern 
uh, for asking us not only to come here, but to do all the work to make it possible. You can't imagine what she had to do. So thanks very much. Thanks for coming down. Our pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'm at virology.ws. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIB is viral. Thank you.